You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul begins his discussion of Exodus chapter 13. I am delighted to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Okay, the tenth sign, we are at the end of Exodus chapter 12, which is the firstborn, and we talked earlier that ultimately that is the object, the aim of the entire series of punishments, which is to erase the progeny of Pharaoh and the Egyptians. It was set up like this in the story. So we can roll, I mean, you can read it for yourself. It begins with the end of chapter 12, and then at the beginning of chapter 13, we hear a very powerful statement. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and of beast, very important, is mine. The best example to give, which is the earliest also in the Bible, is the flood story, where it is not just the human beings, but this is what we stress usually in theology, although we mention the other animals, but we concentrate on the human being as though he or she is the neighbor of the galaxy, and that tainted our theology up to the Middle Ages, we tried to be rid of it, and it came back at the beginning of the 20th century. So it is important that here God differentiates between the firstborn of Egypt and their cattle, and the firstborn of Israel and their cattle, the animal. But here we have a very interesting word, which is consecrate from the root kadosh, kadesh. It's a verb in the pi'al. I mean, we have a parallel example with the deep bear. You know, some verbs are functional in different conjugations. So here, kadesh, those who know Arabic can hear it, that you put aside. Let me make a comment. I may have made it before, but it's good to rehear it. The notion of Kadosh, the sacredness, the holiness, has nothing to do with something inside and spiritual, as people imagine. The the original meaning is to have something taboo, which means it cannot be approached or touched except by certain people, because it is the domain of God. I mean, the Orthodox know that, how, for instance, uh, the people who are allowed to enter into the sanctuary are uh, the clergy and their helpers, and not everyone. You cannot use the sanctuary to to just uh, a passage to go from door to door or from room to room. No, it's holy, and the holiness, let's understand it once and for all, it's a taboo, it's a no-no for the commoner. Hence the notion of consecration, making out of a commoner a non-commoner. Take the, the clergy, ultimately they are human beings, they are not different than the others, they have to eat and sleep and so on and so forth. But when they are serving the Lord in a special way. Then, uh, So please uh, teach this very early so that the people would not be puffed up if they feel as though they are consecrated or something. 
I mean, here in the USA, it should be easy. Speak about the president of the republic or the senator or the representative. In the, so long as you are a member of that body, you are allowed to enter the chambers and the rooms and so on. But otherwise, it is not so. We have another example in the case of the judge when he calls the lawyers to his chambers, his office. They cannot enter whenever they want to enter. Okay, very important. Let's hear it. So you have to consecrate. And they are mine. You refer yourself to someone. You are the priest of the Most High. You are not just a priest. A priest of what? Okay, so this possession is very important. Let's hear it again and again. God in the Bible saves uh, the people of Israel from the slavery of Egypt to make them his slaves. And Paul captured this very powerfully, as we all know. Linked to the feast of Pascha, and we talked about the passage, we have the unleavened bread, which is a reminder that you are on the way, on the road, you don't have time to bake or cook. And so we talked about that when we heard about the lamb. And linked to it very early in the Bible, we have this unleavened bread, which is for seven days. Again, the number seven, we talked about it so many times. You will remember that you were leaving the house of bondage. You know, in Hebrew, we have the house of Abadim, the house of slaves. We do not have the word, uh, if you like, slavery, except in the sense of Abodah, service. It is the same root. It is the place where you used to be Abadim. And the day you are to go forth is the month of Abib, which corresponds to our August. And then when the Lord, in verse 5, brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, okay, we have this series of names, that he swore to your fathers, remember again and again, that the land is not used as though it was given to you, period. No, it is just because God committed himself in a promise to the fathers. When you enter, you shall keep this. And here comes the noun that I mentioned earlier in conjunction with Abadim, which is Aboda. But here again, the English renders it as service, and we imagine that you are a clerk at Wells Fargo and you serve. And, uh, no, let's settle this in the mind of the people. Let's eliminate that word servant. I am at your service, because service is something you offer. You can decide not to serve someone. But in slavery, that is not the case. You are bound. You have no choice. And in verse 9, we hear that, this shall be a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes. Let me say a few words on sign, because in verse 16, the RSV changes the translation of sign oath into a mark. So you can debate that it's the same thing, a mark is a sign and so, but that's not what the hearer is hearing. So, Technical translation is very important, but unfortunately it is impossible. That's why we need to refer to the origin. Oat and Zikron. First of all, let me settle this issue of hand and eyes, between the eyes, and not make it as uh, 
movie that you put something on your eyes and around your wrist and so on, as many Jews do. That's not the point. The hand is the power, the action. And between the eyes, you have the mind that remembers things. Thus, you are to remember, and the word in Hebrew is zikron, from zakar, which is the remembering. So you have to remember, in order to do it, we shall hear this time and again in the book of Deuteronomy. Remember these commandments in order to do them, not just to remember them. But anyone who knows Semitic languages knows this, because we have the same word, shamar, to keep. Keep the commandments. How do you keep them? First, you have to remember them. Otherwise, what are you going to keep? But then remembering them is not enough. You have to do the will of God. So, all this practically is a literary stressing. Remember always, I keep saying about the doubling. It's a sign on your hand and memorial between your eyes. That the law of the Lord may be in your mouth meaning you have to recite it to remember it. How do I know if you remember something? And that's the beautiful statement in Psalm 2, which is butchered already in the Septuagint and all other translations about transforming the Hebrew Haggad to spell each word of the Torah becomes something that means to think about it. So that's not enough. You have to say it. Can you imagine if you come to your finals and you tell me, you know, I have all your teaching in my mind, Father Paul, but I'm not able to find the words to express that. Can you imagine if everybody would do that at the final exam? It's ridiculous. So you have to be able to recite it. And then notice at the end of the verse, it's an interesting verse. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. In other words, he did an action for you. And he is asking you to do in return an action for him to remember that day by eating unleavened bread. And in verse 10, you shall therefore keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Notice here we have to keep the ordinance. It's a rule. You have to do it. And then we have a passage from verses 11 16 about the first born. And this is very interesting here that the first born is referred as being the Feter Rechem, meaning every opener of the womb. And several times I repeated that in the Bible, uh, a woman loses her virginity. In other words, she's no more a virgin. She's no more a bride when she gives birth. And in the Middle East, you start referring to that woman as being um so and so, the mother of so and so. It's very powerful. It's not something that has to do with fancy. It is functional. And Peter, and I discussed this in detail in the rise of scripture, it is someone that cuts, breaks, you know, you break 
notice we use it in English. The waters have broken, you know. Something is coming out, which means that you took the lid off. So it's interesting that in Hebrew you have this connotation. In Arabic is softer. We have opener of the womb. But the root, fatar, those who know Arabic, break fast, to break the fast in Arabic, we refer to it as futur. So to the ear, it's already there. You break your fast in the morning. Now the French are fancier, they call breakfast le petit déjeuner. And then the middle of the day you have the déjeuner. But déjeuner means to break the fast. How many times you break the fast? Once. And technically it is in the morning. Again, extra info to ease you. Again, if you are interested, and I hope that you are interested, that you hear the connotation of the word. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.